بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بالسنة إلى يوم الدين All praise is due to Allah the Lord and cherisher of the universe May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his household companions and the followers of the right guidance till the day of judgment assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may the peace and blessings of allah be upon those who follow the right guidance and all of you good evening and welcome all to the first ever english version of the ramadan forum which is in its ninth year we extend our thanks to His Highness Sheikh Ahmed bin Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum for his generous patronage of this event. Thanks also to our sponsors, Al Nabuda Group, Dubai Islamic Bank, Dubai Electricity and Water Authority, Beit Al Khair Society, General Directorate of Residency and Foreigners Affairs. These were our gold sponsors. For the last eight years, Al Multaka Al Ramadani, or the Ramadan Forum, has been a yearly event organized by the De Dubai's Department of Tourism and Commerce Marketing. Each year, a new slogan is chosen, and last year's slogan was Ramadan Changed Me. This year, being the ninth, under the slogan Nartaki li nartaki, or gathering to succeed, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the ninth Ramadan forum and the talk for tonight. And we pray to Allah that we have many, many more in the future. Gathering to succeed, my brothers and sisters, in a month where there are so many ways to attain success, the doors of paradise are opened and the doors of hellfire are closed, and the devils are chained. It is this blessed month that in every day and night there are those whom Allah grants freedom from the hellfire, and there is for every Muslim a supplication which he can make and it will be granted. For this, pers for this purpose, we have selected for you some of the best international speakers to discuss ways that true success can be gained not only in Ramadan but throughout our lives. Before I introduce our speaker tonight, I would like to inform you that you may send your questions to him by SMS to 050-9400-97. The esteemed speaker tonight was born in Somalia, grew up in Saudi Arabia, and he is none other than Sheikh Saeed Ragia. He later moved on to living in North America in the late 80s. He has a BA in Islamic studies and an MA in the Sharia. He has had several posts over the years, including but not limited to being a founder of Masjid Huda in Montreal and Masjid Aya in Maryland. And he's also the founder of both Muslim Magazine and Al-Aqsa Association. Furthermore, he was a chaplain at both the University of Calgary and the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology. He is currently the Imam of Abu Huraira Masjid in Toronto, Canada. Sheikh Saeed teaches classes in chain of command, sciences of hadith, beautiful patience, tafsir surah Yusuf, and sacred scrolls, and the 40 hadith Nawawi. Without further ado, I introduce you and leave you with tonight's speaker, Shaykh Saeed Ragia. In Alhamdulillah, 
نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد إخوتي في الله اعلموا أن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Brothers and sisters in Islam In our struggle Daily struggle We always face with limitation We always run into that wall We always find ourselves Not moving forward Perhaps, if we ask ourselves the question, why am I in this situation? And what is the problem that I cannot move forward with my life? The clear answer would be because you put yourself in that situation. The answer would be the only limitation that can be put on you is the limitation that you put on yourself. Now, no one else has the authority or the resource or the ability to restrict you, to put you in a cage, to put you in a situation where you cannot move forward. And that's why in this very short talk that I will present from this podium, I will address certain issues that inshallah would allow us to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Therefore, I would need your attention and I would need your imagination because me talking from here only addressing a crowd that is absent-minded would not serve the purpose. But if we can work together and see if we can cross that line that we can all succeed and walk out of this hole with a point and which is I am capable of changing myself. High aspiration. Every single Muslim, every single human being should live under that banner. High aspiration. I want to move forward with my life. See, all of you sitting here, whether you're Amir or Ma'mur, whether you are the man of authority or someone has authority over you, whether you work for someone or you work for yourself and other work for you, others work for you, whether you're in this situation because you want to be here or someone forced you here to be here, whether you like it or not, there is no limitation except the limitation that you have over yourself. Make that clear. And if you look in the lifestyle of Muslims nowadays, they always say, I want to be a humble Muslim. I want to live with the minimum. I want to live with what that is enough for me and my family for the day. I want to live in a simple house. I want to drive a simple car. But this is not what Islam teaches. No. Islam teaches that you must aim higher than that. Islam teaches that if you're driving a certain vehicle, you better upgrade yourself. See, we have new Muslims who accepted Islam. From them, if they were excellent individuals, if they were A students, 
We don't expect them to be A students and just an excellent person, an individual. We expect them to be A+. Plus. We expect them to excel. And Islam allows you that. If you look at the lives of the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will see them always aiming high. You will see them always want better. Being closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to aim high in the status so they can be closer to Allah. Look, for example, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. He's a from a family that used to be slaves. Bani Israel were the servants and the slaves of Fir'aun. But when Allah chose him and made him his own prophet, Allah said about him, وَاسْتَنَعْتُكَ لِلنَّفْسِ وَلِتُسْنَعَ عَلَىٰ عَيْنِ وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَىٰ تَكْلِيمًا Always his status was given to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. And it was enough for him to say, I was chosen out of Bani Israel. I was chosen from a people who used to be slaves. I am a chosen person. And not only that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me all these titles. But no, he wanted to aim higher than that. He wanted to be better than any other prophet that was ever that ever existed. And what did he say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When Allah spoke to him, he said, Oh Allah, you gave me all this status, in another word. But I want to have one thing that no one ever had before. That is, I want to see you. Allow me to see you. See, if you look at the status of Musa, he had everything. He was from the Ul al Azm, from the five chosen prophets. He is the messenger of Allah. But at the same time, he said, No, I want to upgrade my status. I want to be the prophet that saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said, Oh Allah, let me see you. Allow me to see you. Because as a Muslim, this should be your ambition that you always want to aim high. You always want to go higher. Never be content. And I'm not saying that you should be a grateful individual. I'm not saying that you should be a thankful person. No, you should say, Alhamdulillah, what Allah bless me with however I can do better. I can do better. And look, look, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again, he had everything that a prophet can ask for. He was khatim al-anbiya wa rusul He was the seal of the prophets. He was the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Big, before, because of you, and by you, we will seal all the messengers and no one will come after you. But then look, he tells us, I am the first servant that the earth will release him from their graves. He's the first person that will come out of his grave. He is the first person and the only person that Allah would allow to intercede for others. He is the only person, the only person that gates of Jannah would open, no one before him. Then look what he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look what he said. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there's only one spot. Imagine from the day that Allah created Adam and the jinns, to the last day, there's only one spot that everyone that Allah create can aim and dream about. One spot. Not for two, not for second and third and fourth. One spot. Did he say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I love my brother, my, my father Ibrahim Alayhi Salam, let him have that spot? Did he say, I want my brother Musa to have that spot? 
He say no. After every adhan, ask Allah to give me the wasila, to give me that place, to allow me to be that place that is only for one person. And that's why every time, and not only that, he said, if you do this for me, I will intercede for you on the day of Yawm al Qiyamah. After you heard the adhan, if you say, Allahumma rabbi hadihi da'wati tama wa salati al-qaim ati Muhammad al-wasilata wal-fadila, wa ba'athu Allahumma qam al-mahamud al-ladhi wa'ad, that is status. He said then, my shafa'a is yours. See, your messenger of Allah, did not want to be a second person. Because second is always forgotten. You know, imagine, look at the light, look around you, look at, see this light. They only, when they're talking about the history of energy and electricity, they will only mention the man who came up with, not the man who developed. When they're talking about, you know, telephones, they only mention the man who came up with. When we're talking about fuqaha, we always start with Abu Hanifa because he is the first place. There's always no place for second person. So as a Muslim, if you say, I am content, I'm happy, I'm satisfied with the second place, then I will tell you that is a status and the mentality of a loser. Because your messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said only one person. And he aimed that. He said the nations, the prophets will present their followers. I want to be the one who has most followers. Therefore, marry women and have children. He wants to be first. He wants you and I, because since we are his followers, to be first of nations. But look at the status of the Muslims nowadays. We are on the back burner. We are on the wagon. We are all way behind all other nations. You know why? Do you know why we became followers, not leaders? It's because we no longer aim high. We no longer aim high. Look, now if one of the brothers takes off his hat and sees what is, what the hat is made he will see that hat probably made in China. You know, if you see the car that you're driving, perhaps that car was made elsewhere. If you look into your shoes, you will probably see that shoes was made by someone other than Muslims. So we became followers. And this is not what a Muslim should be. Muslims should lead, ikhwati fillah. Do you know, for your general information, do you know that we as Muslims came up all this social principle and aspect that the people live by today? See, in Canada, when your child is born, where I live, in Canada, when your child is born, they give you something called child allowance. Which means every month your child will receive money from the government. And then when you go to a Muslim and say, oh my God, we don't have that back home. Guess what? We came up with that cancer. It was Umar ibn Khattab who came up with child allowance cancer. It was Umar ibn Khattab who said, no, 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 no. Every Muslim child that is born, he should get salary from Bayt al-Mal. Do you know, ikhwati fillah, and I'm not talking about medicine, engineering, chemicals. We're not talking about math. We're not going to say, oh, mashallah, Muslims are the first people who came up with zero. The num I'm not talking about zero, I mean no result. Number zero, that digit, we came up with. Imagine now math without zero. We came up with that. You know, I'm not talking about these simple things. But do you know this the concept of animal rights? My brother last night mentioned some of it. Do you know at the time of Umar bin Abdul Aziz, 
We had departments. Departments. And the Bait al Man. And this department is funded, is a government funded department. And what did they do? They cater one of the departments to blind animals. Now, like imagine the government is funding an organization, a department of its, its, its own government, and say we will hire people to take care of blind cats. Do you have that in anywhere else? Muslims came up with the concept of animals' right. Do you know at that time, we had department from retired animals, camels, mules, donkeys, horses. When they got old, nowadays in Canada, we put them down. But do you know in the Muslim country, our ulama and rulers said, they did their due. Now it's time for us to serve them. Let them die in peace. Do you know that? No, we don't. We only think Muslims are always in need, you know, under the mercy of others. No, we let the world to light. We let the world to light. And this is ya ikhwati fillah, what you and I are missing. Missing our history. And look at the Sahaba. Look at the Sahaba. Because when the teacher is great, can only produce a great student. When hadith of Sahih Muslim, min hadith Rabi'at ibn Ka'b al Aslami. Now listen to the hadith. Rabi'ah, this man, was a simple man. Very devoted, dedicated, decent, sincere. Muslim. And he took upon himself to serve the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I want to serve you, O messenger of Allah. So he served. And Rasulullah, you know, like most of you, he used to give back to those who give. If you do him a favor, he will give back and do you a favor. Not just saying, Jazakallahu khairan, walk away. No. He, if you give him a gift, he will give you a gift. If you do him a favor, he will do you a favor. If you give him something, he will give you something in return. So he saw this man bringing water in the middle of the night for wudu. See him, this man, always serving. فَقَالَ يَا رَبِيعَ سَلْ O Rabi'ah, ask. O Rabi'ah, ask. Now imagine you have the opportunity to ask someone of authority anything that you want. Imagine if the Amir says to you, What do you want? What would you say? What would I say? I would say, I want, an, I, want, I want a palace, and I want Lexus, and BMW would be perfect. You know, maybe two or three of them. You know, I want something decent. But Rabi'ah, he said, As'aluka, I'm asking you, Murafiqataka, to be your companions in Jannah, in paradise. He did not say, Ya Rasulullah, appoint me as a governor of the city of Mecca. He did not say, let me be in charge of Bayt al-Mal. Fire Bilal, he is a very fist-tight person. He's not giving much. I'll take care of business. No. He said, I want to be your companion in Jannah. Rasulullah was shocked. Yani, a smart man. Qala awa ghayru dhali. He said, do you have any other wish? Do you have anything else? Should I make dua for you to Allah give you wealth? Should I make dua for Allah to give you more beautiful wives? Should I make dua for Allah to give you beautiful children, strong children? Qala, huwa dhak. That's what I want. See, this man was extremely a business-minded Sahabi. Because he realized that this dunya is faniya. It's going to perish. It's going to disappear. It's just a matter of days. However, status 
in Jannah means something. In paradise means something. So he said, I don't want to be far away from you. I want to be right next to you. Intelligent. See, Muhammad Iqbal said, قال المؤمن الضعيف يتعلل he said the weak mu'min he find excuses in al-qada wal-qadr he said what well, I couldn't get the job because you know alhamdulillah Allah decreed I couldn't you know get married because I'm, I'm really don't he said no والمؤمن القوي he said هو he said, it is him who is the qada of Allah and his qadr. Is in that individual, that person, that Allah will make change in the environment. Muhammad Iqbal, a Pakistani poet, shair, a Pakistani poet, who, mashaAllah, Allah gave him some inside ilm, regardless of a little... You know, Alhamdulillah. But look how he analyzed the situation. He said, a weak mu'min always find excuses. And he said, well, this is what Allah decreed for me. I'm going to just be a driver. I'm going to be just working as a teacher because this is my qadr. He said, no. Mu'min al-qawi, the strong mu'min, is the one who acts as the qada of Allah and his decree, his qadr. Make the change. Do not expect change to come to you. So this is an attitude of a mu'min. Umar ibn Khattab, he said, لا تصغرن من همتك. He said, do not lower your desire, your aspiration, your ambition. Do not lower it. He said, nothing is more harmful to you than lowering your ambition. Saying, Alhamdulillah, I have this, I'm okay. That's not you. Allah did not create you to be someone like that. Allah created you to lead whole humanity. Allah created you to change and lead these people to, to their Lord. Lead them to Allah. And don't be weak. Because weak is a sign. Weak being weak is a sign of that you gave up. No. And look Abu Bakr al-Siddiq al-Hadithu fi Sahih al-Bukha, Sahih muslim ghayri. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Messenger of Allah with the Sahaba. And Allah, the Messenger of Allah said, Man anfaqa, he said, whoever spends two things, two dirham, two dinar, two dollars, two, two goats, two sheep, anything, two. Then a caller would call and would say to you, you are in this is khair for you. This is khair for you. And then he said, so if you were from the people of Sadaqah, your name would be called from the gate of Sadaqah. And you are, if you are from the people of Jihad, of Salah, then your name would be called from the gate of Salah. And if you're from the people of jihad, then your name will be called from the gate of jihad. And if, if you are from the people of siyam, fasting, then your name will be called from the gate of rayyan. Now, look at this. Look, look at the imaginings and the desire of this sahabi, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Man nabi mithlika ya Abu Bakr, tamshi ruwayda wa tajiu fil awwal. Yeah, who can be like Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, walking light and easy, but he's always first. He said to him, Ya Rasulullah, there is no harm, there is no problem if your name is called from any of these gates. However, he said, is there a person that his name can be called from all gates of Jannah? He said, yes, and I hope you're going to be one of them. You know, he did not say, I want to enter Jannah from Babi Rayyan. Alhamdulillah, I'm in Jannah, forget it. You know, the man, he cannot enter from all eight gates, but he wants to reach that status. Hey, wait a second. I want my name to be called from gate al Rayyan, from gate al Jihad, from gate al Sadaqah, from gate al this. I want my name to be everywhere. See, a Muslim, you may say, I just want to be in Jannah, just Jannah. No. The Messenger of Allah said, if you ask Allah, ask Him 
paradise? No. Al Firdaus al A'la. There are eight different levels. Your messenger is saying, don't settle with any paradise. Ask for a Firdaus al A'la. Because this is aiming high. You know why? Because the day that you say, I'm just going to aim for a Jannah, then you may not reach. One of the Salaf rahimahullah said to his son, Man qudwatuk? He said to his son, Who is your role model? Now imagine a son, young boy, his father's asking him, Who is your role model? And the young boy, he contemplated. He reflected on the situation. And he realized his father goes for Fajr in congregation. His father goes to Hajj. He gives Sadaqah. He prays Qiyam al Layl. He is the Alim from Ulama al Ummah. He does everything. And then the young boy came to the conclusion. He said, I want to be like you. Your son always want to be like you. Why? Because to him, you're the best. You're the best until he reaches the age of, you know, he just loses his mind. You know, to him, you're the best. And the father, like a lion, he came back and he said, You're nothing but a loser. Look at me, he said. He said, I wanted to be like Ali ibn Abi Talib. And look at my status. Why? Because if you aim low, you're going to get lower. But if you aim higher, if you aim to be next to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in paradise, then you may be with a'imma. You may be with a tabi'een. You may be with people of ilm and righteousness. So always, brothers, always, never, ever say, I'm satisfied, I'm content with what I am. No, and I'm not, again, again, do not misunderstand my message. Do not say, I want to be a person who disregard everything that Allah gave. No, no. Ibn al-Qayyim said, rahimahullah, the ultimate goal that a mu'min should aim for is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm asking you to do this through halal means. I'm asking you to live a life of a Muslim that is not satisfied with the simple thing that he has. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. He said, I have a nafs. I have a nafs that always aims high. He said, first that I desire was to be a alim, to learn ilm. Then I became alim. And then he said, and then I desire to marry the daughter of the Khalifa, Fatima. So I married her. And then I desire to be a governor. So I, I got the, to be the governor of the city of Medina. He said, then I wish and I desire to be the Khalifa, the king, the ruler of a Muslims. He said, then I got it. Now look at the status. Alim, he became an alim. Married father, to marry Fatima, he married Fatima. To be a governor, he became a governor. To be a Khalifa, he became a Khalifa. He said, but now my nafs Desires Jannah. Desires Jannah. So look at yourself. Look at this man. He took steps. Practical steps. Now what you need to do is always, always aim higher than your status. If you have only high school diploma, say no, I want to get my college degree. If you have that, say, no, I want to go to university. If you have that, you say, no, I want to do my master's. If you have that, you say, no, I want my PhD. If you have that, you say, wait a second, what else can I do? There is always room for improvement. And the sky is the limit. 
But the only enemy that you have is you. The only limitation that you have is you, no one else. You know, we have, subhanAllah, in my community, we have a, a Chinese man who accepted Islam. Chinese. You know, he doesn't speak Arabic. He can't read Arabic. Arabic is not his language. He doesn't know much about Islam other than the basic the principles of Islam and the fundamentals of Islam. So he accepted Islam. He came and he said, Imam Sa'id, what else can I do? What else can I do? I'm a new Muslim. I just embrace Islam. What else can I do? I said, do the best that you can. He comes back four months later. Four months later. He can read Arabic. He can conversate in Arabic. Not all perfect. You know, understandable. But he can converse, he can talk to you. I said, no, 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 you know, you teach them these basics. He said, yes, yes, I remember that. You know. But the idea is in four months, he was able to ask questions. And then he said, Brother Sayyid, Imam Sayyid also memorized 15 surahs. I said, subhanAllah. The kids, our own kids who were born from Muslim family are struggling with Alam Tara Kayfa Fa'ala Rabbuka Bi Ashabi Al-Feel. You have 15 surah in five, in four months. He said, yes, and let me recite it to you. Now imagine a Chinese brand new Muslim who Alhamdulillah, he grew his beard, he's wearing his little kufi, as though it's not necessary, and he's reciting Quran. He's reciting, and I didn't know what to do. Should I cry for my problems? Should I cry for the problems of my ummah? Should I cry for the situation? Should I correct that little mistakes and the lahn al khafi and jelly that he has in his recitation? Should I feel proud and just hug him? Should I say to him, listen, you're putting us into shame? Please go hide somewhere else. Should I hide the rest of the Muslims away from this man? What should I do? In four months, able to read, write, conversate, and memorize Arabic, the Quran, 15 surahs. And he, I said, you did well. He said, I'm afraid that I disappointed you, Imam. I wanted to do more. And I looked at the Muslims. And I said, wait a second. What are our kids doing? And I looked in my office, and you know what our children are doing? You know, BBM. You know what BBM means? Blackberry messaging. I don't know if you have it here. And they're just doing like this. Ya Fulan, did you do your Quran? Oh, no, Sheikh. Ya Fulan. So the reason is because we did not aim high. But this is a small percentage of Muslims. I know the majority of you are aiming high. And when I say drive the best, because the Rasulullah wrote the best. His camel was the best of the camels. Don't say that the camel of the messenger was from a welfare camel or a camel, a weak camel that they got it from, from a, you know, outworked zoo. And by the way, that zoo, Muslims came out with the zoo, the council of the zoo, we came out with. But alhamdulillah, no credit for that, I guess. Again, concentrate, focus, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our effort. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us, give us that insight light that encourages us, that enables us to do things for ummah. In conclusion, I want to say this. This ummah has only you, no one else. This deen has only you, no one else. 
And on the day of Yom Al-Qiyamah, when we are standing in front of the Messenger of Allah, what can we say to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What have we done? I mean, you come and Khalid bin Walid has nine banded swords. You come, you have Mu'ad bin Jabal, who was the Imam of the Ulama on the day of Yom Al Qiyamah. You come and you have Umar bin Khattab who gave half of his wealth, who died for the sake of Islam. You have Abu Bakr who gave all his wealth. You come and you have Ahmed bin Hanbal, his back is speaking on his behalf, it's being lashed. You come and you have Al Arsalan who march against the enemy of Islam with the minimum number. What are you and I going to present on the day of Yom Al Qiyam? How can we compete with these people and say, This is what I did for my deen, this is what I did for Islam, Abu Bakr? Umar, step aside, I'm here. Ikhwati fillah. There is no one else for this deen except you. There is no other hope except you. There is no other future except you. So your chin, make it up. Pick it up. Go walk with, you know, raise your head. Why? Because you belong to Ummati Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Be proud of who you are. Present Islam with no shines, with no shame, with no grief. And live Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. Wa jazakum Allah khair subhanahu wa subhanahu wa izzati amma yasfi wa salam ala al-mursi wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakallah khair and shaykh for this enlightening talk. Um, we have a few questions from both the ends, the ladies and the gentlemen. We're going to um, start... Men, I'm going to start mentioning the questions to you, Sheikh. First question is, uh, can one touch and read Quran without wudu? And uh, the second part of the question is, can a woman in her monthly cycle read Quran by memory, touch or read a Quran? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <clears throat> this subject goes back to the subject which is the original subject, which is, is, is tahara necessary? for uh, touching the Mus'haf. And as our ulama rahimahumullah stated, there are different, two different, different opinions concerning the issue. The first of the opinion says that you cannot touch the Mus'haf in the state or unless you are in the state of Tahara. And the other state, the opinion is the opinion that yes, you can touch it because there is no evidence Based on the hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the hadith Abu Bakr is Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu, when the messenger of Allah said, Subhanallah, wa hal yanjus al mu'min. He said, Subhanallah, can a mu'min ever be impure? And of course, al marbat is qawlullah, qawlullah subhanahu wa qawlullah ta'ala fi in la yamissu illa al mutahharun. In a nutshell, not to belong or confuse you, we will consider. Statement basing on the statement of Ibn Uthameen rahimahullah, if you have a Musham with a cover that is permissible, but al awla and it's preferable for you to be in the state of wudu. For the sisters who are doing her menses or during that time of the month, there is no evidence, there's no proof that she cannot read the Quran. She cannot read the Quran and the ulama, such as Ahmad al Shafi'iyya wa ghayrihim. Man adhinu that a person who Allah, who those who allow that she can read half of an ayah or part of an ayah, they have no evidence for that. And the correct opinion, since there is no clear evidence on all the ahadith that is being reported concerning the issue is weak, is it's permissible and there is no harm for her to read reading the Quran. Jazakallah khairan. Um, the next question is more like more of an aqidah question. Uh, I don't know, it's actually a question or a statement, but somebody is saying that uh, people say that, you know, uh, um, Allah does not have a gender, but it is mentioned as huwa or he for Allah in the Quran. And some of the characteristics and qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have been mentioned, which are also characteristics like anger and happiness for humans. How do you reconciliate that? For the first part, see, in Arabic, we have huwa wahiyya. 
only two terms can be used. In English, we have he, she, and it. Three different uh, word, letters that you, words that can, you can use. Now, when you, can, when you want to translate, when the translators want to translate Allah, it cannot be it, and it cannot be she. Therefore, they chose the word huwa or he in English. And of course, in Arabic, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a female, nor he has a gender as we know, but it's more linguistic uh, terminology that is being used. In terms of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as a mu'min, as a mu'minin and a Muslims, we believe whatever came from the book of Allah is true and there's no doubt in it. And whatever came from the sunnah, authentic sunnah of the messenger of Allah is true and there is no doubt in it. Therefore, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states a certain attributes, the attributes of smiling, the attributes of anger, the attributes of mercy, we said, yes, it is part of, uh, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and we accept. Are these related to the anger of a human, nor, or are they similar to the anger or the attributes of a human? The answer is no. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Laysa kamithli his shay, and this there's none uh, equivalent or like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but this is something other than how you interpret or understand Allahu Alam. Alright, there's a question here which is a common misconception in uh, our societies about giving the Quran to non Muslims. Uh, what is the ruling regarding this? How do we um, you know present this to the non-Muslims. And the other part of the question is, how do we give da'wah to the non-Muslims? Da'wah to the non-Muslims, da'wah. Giving the mushaf, based on the ijma' al-fuqaha of this time that we rely on, if the mushaf has two different languages, English and the Arabic, that this is cannot be called mushaf, this is a translation of the Qur'an based on Sheikh bin Baz ibn Uthameen and Albani and others. Therefore, it's acceptable for you to give that to a non-Muslim because in reality, you're not giving the mushaf, you're giving a mushaf, mushaf being part of that. Ibn Hazm al-Zahiri went to the level that even the actual mushaf, you can give it to a non-Muslim because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-Bukhari wa ghayri, that he wrote letters and in those letters he add ayat, therefore a non-Muslim can have part of the Qur'an. However, correct opinion of this, bi'idnillah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, if you have a mushaf that has English and Arabic together, this is in the min, min qabil, from the type of tafsir of Qur'an, and it's not the actual Qur'an. It's like giving uh, tafsir ibn kathir to someone. However, just to be on the safe side, if you have Qur'an that is all English, better. Why? Because the non-Muslim may, may put the Qur'an in the bathroom, and of course, they are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My nasiha to the brothers and the sisters who are handing out Quran is the non muslims a lot of times, especially the ones that we know, they are very respectful in a sense that they would not disrespect something that you gave. And if you give them instruction and say, listen, you know, be respectful to this book, we honor and we respect and please keep it out of you know, impurity places and status and situation, they usually do. But again, to, to be on the safe side, Give them that little introduction, and if you cannot do this, I think it would be better if you give a Quran, complete Quran. How should we give da'wah? Which is the second part of the question. A lot of people assume, which is also good, that, that by giving out some material, reading material, DVD of Zak Nai, uh, Yusuf Estes, and this, you know, it helps. Absolutely, that helps. Some others, they say, you know, we should have a booth and we should preach to the non-Muslims and tell them about Islam, which is also okay. But this is not the, the thing that I would say. The best da'wah that you can give to a non-Muslim is you living Islam. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't be late, don't cut corners, don't you know, play games, be straightforward. Just live Islam as simple as that. When a sister, she's walking outside of her house, she's not, she doesn't have a makeup, 
She's not smelling all, mashallah, beautiful. She doesn't have her hair in a certain way. And mashallah, people will see her as a walking ayah. Quran, that is walking, because she is an ayah in that aspect. Now, when she, lower her, lower, when she lowers her gaze, when she talks to a man is straightforward and formal, people will say, other women will say, well, she demands respect. This attitude, this behavior demands respect. Therefore, they will respect. When they see you, when your neighbor sees you, Ramadan, you give them food, you give them drink, you help them out, you clean your area, your house, the front of your house is clean, your house is always clean, you, you're not loud, you don't play music, Pakistan or Indian or Somali or Arab loud music, you just do this, then again, they will say, I want to know about this. Keep in mind, the only reason that our brothers in Malaysia and, and Indonesia accepted Islam, is not through literature, it's not through lectures, it's not through ulama, it was just a behavior exchange. What impressed them was their behavior. So if you live Islam, you are perfect, excellent da'ya. And that's why when Aisha radiyallahu anhu, the hadith is sahih, Sheikh al-Albani wa when Aisha was asked about the khuluq of the messenger of Allah, qalat kana khuluquhu al-Qur'an. She said his manners was the Qur'an. And this is enough, ya ikhwati fillah, wallahu a'ala wa a'lam. Just the last question uh, for tonight. Um, someone is asking that, is it wrong to be content with the dunya and yet aim high for the akhira? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the hadith of Sahih or Al-Albani, in the Sira and other, he says, man kanat al-dunya akbar hammi, ja'ala Allahu al-faqra bayna aynayhi, farraqa alayhi shamlah, ولم تأتيه من الدنيا إلا ما كتب له وفي رواية لم تأتيه من الدنيا وإن من الدنيا إن نعم. The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said, whosoever he is concerned, the most concerned is his worldly life, that Allah سبحانه وتعالى would place poverty between his eyes and this dunya he would not gain from this dunya except which is that which is written. ومن كانت الآخرة and whosoever his desire and aim and ultimate goal is آخرة is it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said he will place richness between his two eyes. And then he said, Allah alayhi wa sallam, wa dunya wa hiya raghima wa fi riwaya raghiba. He said, and this dunya will come to him, and the dunya is forced to be under his knee, knees. Or another narration means, the dunya will come to him, desiring him. So, what I'm saying is this. You utilize whatever you have in this dunya. However, you utilize it and use it as a means for akhirah. I'll give you an example. Now, if you're well off, if you're well off, you have enough for your family and for yourself. Now, what can you do? You can give zakah. You can go to Africa or Asia and give da'wah. You can support them. You can sponsor your team. You can sponsor a needy family. You can come here in Dubai and give da'wah left and right because now you're self-sufficient. But imagine if you have to work 12 hours for your daily living. Imagine if you have to do all this. When are you going to give da'wah? And if your income is hand to mouth. So what I'm saying is upgrade yourself not for the purpose of living and reclining on this dunya for the purpose of akhirah. If you are a doctor, walillahi alhamd, and you have a well income that comes, well off income, you can give a lot of your time and do da'wah. So what I'm trying to say here, use the means for Allah. Do not accumulate wealth and be like Qarun, but use it as a mean that it will make you from the people of Jannah. Hadith Aisha radiyallahu atar, hadith Aisha, when when Abdurrahman bin Auf, when كان في الحديث كلام, Abdurrahman bin Auf رضي الله عنه came to the city of Medina with a one thousand camel loaded with everything that a people need, businessman, straight businessman, and then the whole city shook. The whole city and the people came out. What is happening? They say caravan of Abdurrahman bin Auf. Aisha رضي الله عنها said. I heard the Messenger of Allah saying 
that Abdul Rahman bin Auf will enter Jannah crawling again. The hadith is the maqal. The hadith has been ulama spoke about the hadith. Now, the author is that Uthman bin Auf, I'm sorry, Abdul Rahman bin Auf went to Aisha radiyallahu anha and he said, did you hear this from the messenger of Allah? She said, yes. He said, by Allah, by Allah, I'll make you my witness that everything that I have here is sadaqa fi sabilillah. Wallahi, I will, I will try to enter Jannah walking. So what Abdurrahman bin Auf did was, utilize what Allah blessed him with to be in Jannah. So that's what I'm trying to say here. Not to accumulate, 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 accumulate wealth and be like Qarun. No. Be like Abu Bakr, Abdurrahman bin Auf, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas, you know, Abdurrahman bin Auf and others. Wallahu a'la wa a'lam. Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khair. And Shaykh, uh, there is a comment over here. Please don't conclude yet. We want more, please. But unfortunately, alhamdulillah, every good thing has to come to an end. So um, we have to conclude uh, the talk tonight. And the question and answers, just before we leave, we have one uh, um, brother over here who'd like to come into Islam. He's ready over here, so we would like him to come up on the stage and take uh, the testimony of the faith with the Shaykh, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Just for the non-Muslim who are watching this or being part of this, you have to understand, walillahi alhamd, by our brother stating the kalima or the shahada, the testimony there is only one God worthy, worthy of worship, the following, the, follow thing, the following thing happens. One, he becomes part of us. We love him, and we will love him like we love our own blood, biological brothers. Two, all of his sins are forgiven. In Christianity, we have or they have the, the original sin. In Islam, you were born with no sin, and by the time you return to Allah, by stating the shahada, you also become no sin, and sinless. And that's why we call them a revert, not a convert. Now, the second, the third thing that happens is his life changed and becomes a better person. So I would encourage all the non-Muslims just to reflect on that, and may Allah guide us all. Now he will say after me, what's your good name? Jane. Jane. Jane, my name is Saeed. Nice meeting you. Same thing with me. Jane, you're going to repeat the statement of your life, and this is the turn of your life, a new beginning, new light. So you say, Ashhadu. Ashhadu. An. An. La. La. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illa. Illa. Allah. Allah. Wa ashhad. Wa ashhad. An. An. Muhammad. Muhammad. Rasul. Rasul. Allah. Allah. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Just a word of wisdom. When you welcome your Muslim brother, let him see the beauty of Islam. Let him see that we are warm people. Let him see the care that Islam teach. Let him see the beauty of being a Muslim. Not a person that we just hug him on the stage and he drops down and that's it. But let him be a member of the family. Wallahu a'ala wa'ala